The Time Machine by H. G. Wells, Chapter 6. It may seem odd to you, but it was two days before I could follow up the newfound clue in what was manifestly the proper way. I felt a peculiar shrinking from those pallid bodies. They were just the half-bleached color of the worms and things one sees preserved in spirit in a zoological museum. And they were filthily cold to the touch. Probably my shrinking was largely due to the sympathetic influence of the Eloi, whose disgust with the Morlocks I now began to appreciate. The next night I did not sleep well. Probably my health was a little disordered. I was oppressed with perplexity and doubt. Once or twice I had a feeling of intense fear for which I could perceive no definite reason. I remember creeping noiselessly into the great hall where the little people were sleeping in the moonlight. That night, Wena was among them and feeling reassured by their presence. It occurred to me even then that in the course of a few days the moon must pass through its last quarter and the nights grow dark. When the appearances of these unpleasant creatures from below, these whitened lemurs, this new vermin that had replaced the old, might be more abundant. And on both these days I had the restless feeling of one who shirks an inevitable duty. I felt assured that the time machine was only to be recovered by boldly penetrating these underground mysteries. Yet I could not face the mystery. If only I had a companion, it would have been different. But I was so horribly alone, and even to clamber down into the darkness of the well appalled me. I don't know if you will understand my feeling, but I never felt quite safe at my back. It was this restlessness, this insecurity, perhaps, that drove me further and further afield in my exploring expeditions. Going to the south, westward, toward the rising country that is now called Combe Wood, I observed far off in the direction of 19th century Barnstead, a vast green structure, different in character from any I had hitherto seen. It was larger than the largest of the palaces or ruins I knew, and the façade had an oriental look. The face of it having the luster as well as the pale green tint, a kind of bluish green of a certain type of Chinese porcelain. This difference in aspect suggested a difference in use, and I was minded to push on and explore. But the day was growing late, and I had come upon the site of the place after a long and tiring circuit, so I resolved to hold over the adventure for the following day and I returned to the welcome and caresses of little Wena. But next morning I perceived clearly enough that my curiosity regarding the Palace of Green Porcelain was a piece of self-deception to enable me to shirk by another day an experience I dreaded. I resolved I would make the descent without further waste of time and started out in the early morning towards a well near the ruins of granite and aluminum. Little Wena ran with me. She danced beside me to the well, but when she saw me lean over the mouth and look downward, she seemed strangely disconcerted. Goodbye, little Wena, I said, kissing her. And then, putting her down, I began to feel over the parapet for the climbing hooks. Rather hastily, I might as well confess, for I feared my courage might leak away. At first, she watched me in amazement. Then she gave a most piteous cry, and running to me, she began to pull at me with her little hands. I think her opposition nerved me rather to proceed. I shook her off, perhaps a little roughly, and in another moment I was in the throat of the well. I saw her agonized face over the parapet and smiled to reassure her. Then I had to look down at the unstable hooks to which I clung. I had to clamber down a shaft of perhaps 200 yards. The descent was effected by means of metallic bars projecting from the sides of the well, and these being adapted to the needs of a creature much smaller and lighter than myself. I was speedily cramped and fatigued by the descent. And not simply fatigued. One of the bars bent suddenly under my weight and almost swung me off into the blackness beneath. For a moment, I hung by one hand, and after that experience I did not dare to rest again. 
Though my arms and back were presently acutely painful, I went on clambering down the sheer descent with as quick a motion as possible. Glancing upward, I saw the aperture, a small blue disk in which a star was visible, while little Wenna's head showed as a round black projection. The thudding sound of a machine below grew louder and more oppressive. Everything save that little disk above was profoundly dark, and when I looked up again, Wenna had disappeared. I was in an agony of discomfort. I had some thought of trying to go up the shaft again and leave the underworld alone. But even while I turned this over in my mind, I continued to descend. At last, with intense relief, I saw dimly coming up, a foot to the right of me, a slender loophole in the wall. Swinging myself in, I found it was the aperture of a narrow horizontal tunnel in which I could lie down and rest. It was not too soon. My arms ached, my back was cramped, and I was trembling with the prolonged terror of a fall. Besides this, the unbroken darkness had had a distressing effect upon my eyes. The air was full of the throb and hum of machinery pumping air down the shaft. I do not know how long I lay. I was roused by a soft hand touching my face. Starting up in the darkness, I snatched at my matches and, hastily striking one, I saw three stooping white creatures, similar to the one I had seen above ground in the ruin, hastily retreating before the light. Living as they did in what appeared to be impenetrable darkness, their eyes were abnormally large and sensitive, just as are the pupils of the abysmal fishes, and they reflected the light in the same way. I have no doubt they could see me in that rayless obscurity, and they did not seem to have any fear of me apart from the light. But so soon as I struck a match in order to see them, they fled incontinently, vanishing into dark gutters and tunnels from which their eyes glared at me in the strangest fashion. I tried to call to them, but the language they had was apparently different from that of the overworld people, so that I was needs left to my own unaided efforts and the thought of flight before exploration was even then in my mind. But I said to myself, you are in for it now. And feeling my way along the tunnel, I found the noise of machinery grow louder. Presently the walls fell away from me, and I came to a large open space, and striking another match, saw that I had entered a vast arched cavern, which stretched into utter darkness beyond the range of my light. The view I had of it was as much as one could see in the burning of a match. Necessarily, my memory is vague. Great shapes, like big machines, rose out of the dimness, and cast grotesque black shadows in which dim spectral Morlocks sheltered from the glare. The place, by the by, was very stuffy and oppressive, and the faint halitus of freshly shed blood was in the air. Some way down the central vista was a little table of white metal, laid with what seemed a meal. The Morlocks, at any rate, were carnivorous. Even at the time, I remember wondering what large animal could have survived to furnish the red joint I saw. It was all very indistinct. The heavy smell, the big unmeaning shapes, the obscene figures lurking in the shadows and only waiting for the darkness to come at me again. Then the match burned down and stung my fingers, and fell, a wriggling red spot in the blackness. I have thought since how particularly ill-equipped I was for such an experience. When I had started with the time machine, I had started with the absurd assumption that the men of the future would certainly be infinitely ahead of ourselves in all their appliances. I had come without arms, without medicine, without anything to smoke. At times I missed tobacco frightfully, even without enough matches. If only I had thought of a Kodak, I could have flashed that glimpse of the underworld in a second and examined it at a leisure. But as it was, I stood there with only the weapons and the powers that nature had endowed me with, hands, feet, and teeth, these and four safety matches that still remained to me. I was afraid to push my way in among all this machinery in the dark, and it was only with my last glimpse of light I discovered that my store of matches had run low. 
It had never occurred to me until that moment that there was any need to economize them, and I had wasted almost half the box in astonishing the upper worlders to whom fire was a novelty. Now, as I say, I had four left, and while I stood in the dark, a hand touched mine. Lank fingers came feeling over my face, and I was sensible of a peculiar unpleasant odor. I fancied I heard the breathing of a crowd of those dreadful little beings about me. I felt the box of matches in my hand being gently disengaged, and other hands behind me plucking at my clothing. The sense of these unseen creatures examining me was indescribably unpleasant. The sudden realization of my ignorance of their ways of thinking and doing came home to me very vividly in the darkness. I shouted at them as loudly as I could. They started away, and then I could feel them approaching me again. They clutched at me more boldly, whispering odd sounds to each other. I shivered violently and shouted again rather discordantly. This time they were not so seriously alarmed, and they made a queer laughing noise as they came back at me. I will confess I was horribly frightened. I determined to strike another match and escape under the protection of its glare. I did so, and eking out the flicker with a scrap of paper from my pocket, I made good my retreat to the narrow tunnel. But I had scarce entered this when my light was blown out, and in the blackness I could hear the moorlocks rustling like wind among leaves and pattering like the rain as they hurried after me. In a moment I was clutched by several hands, and there was no mistaking that they were trying to haul me back. I struck another light and waved it in their dazzled faces. You can scarce imagine how nauseating inhuman they looked, those pale, chinless faces and great, lidless, pinkish-gray eyes, as they stared in their blindness and bewilderment. But I did not stay to look, I promise you. I retreated again, and when my second match had ended, I struck my third. It had almost burned through when I reached the opening into the shaft. I lay down on the edge, for the throb of the great pump below made me giddy. Then I felt sideways for the projecting hooks, and as I did so, my feet were grasped from behind, and I was violently tugged backward. I lit my last match, and it incontinently went out. But I had my hand on the climbing bars now, and kicking violently, I disengaged myself from the clutches of the Morlocks, and was speedily clambering up the shaft while they stayed peering and blinking up at me all but one little wretch who followed me for some way and well-nigh secured my boot as a trophy. That climb seemed interminable to me. With the last twenty or thirty feet of it, a deadly nausea came upon me. I had the greatest difficulty in keeping my hold. The last few yards was a frightful struggle against this faintness. Several times my head swam, and I felt all the sensations of falling. At last, however, I got over the well mouth somehow, and staggered out of the ruin into the blinding sunlight. I fell upon my face. Even the soil smelt sweet and clean. Then I remember Wenna kissing my hands and ears, and the voices of others among the Eloi. Then for some time I was insensible. End of chapter.